Hello, my name is Thomas Spencer, and this is TheBibleGuy.com and TheBibleGuyBlog.com. I know it's been a few weeks. We've been posting on writing the book, Revelation, The Final Separation, and uh, we've had some challenges. It's, it was a little harder than I thought to condense this much, this amount of information into smaller bites um, and not over-teach the subject. So uh, it's been difficult. So what I'm, this is going to be a little interlude to get us back into Chapter 5. Um, but before we do, I just want to give you a little introduction. I've, I've had some uh, questions about why I study this at all. So let me just give you some uh, definitions of words, and maybe this will jumpstart us. The word, the uh, suffix word, is ology. Ology. Ology means the study of. So I'm going to give you a few ologies here. The first one is theology. Now you would think that you'd have to go to a Bible college to um, study the subject of theology. But you don't have to. The word just sounds a little bit more scary than what it really is. Theo means divine. It means uh, God. So uh, theology is simply the study of a divine God. And then as you study and you discover a divine God, as we have, it also helps you how to interact with that God in your physical and spiritual life. So theology is the, simply the study of a divine God and then what you do with it. So here's another one. Eschatology. Eschatology. It's another ology. Ology is the study of. Esco or eschato is um, simply is translates into the word last. Last. Last things. Last things of mankind. Last things of history. So eschatology is the study of last things or the study of end times, or the study of man's last days on earth, and the study of the last days of earth. So eschatology is simply the study of last things in history. Okay, so now here's the interesting thing of it all. We have been so bombarded over the last 30, 40 years. Is the Bible true? I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe anything you're going to say because the Bible's not true. And if the Bible's not true, I don't have to listen to you. And nothing you have to say has to do with me. And yet, the Bible is the book who has been that has been ejected out of the public forum, out of schools, out of the public marketplace. The Bible is the one thing that is so scary to the world that they... they they're trying to eliminate it. And the other, of course, the other thing is the name of Jesus. But, but here's the interesting thing about the Bible. We're never told we don't have to defend it. We just have to use it because it's alive and powerful, quick, sharper than a two-edged sword. I don't ever defend the Bible. I just use it. But here's some facts about the Bible. Now we're talking about theology, the study of God, eschatology, the study of end times. And where do we get most of our information of the study of end times? It's from the Bible. Okay, the Bible is the, now hear this, these are truths. The Bible is the oldest, most tested, and trusted manuscript in the world. Let that sink in. We don't ever have to apologize for our Bible. It, th these are great things. The Bible is the number one validated text, not only documenting history, uh, or the history of our world and mankind, but also revealing the future or final days and events of mankind and the world. So if we're studying end time events, we're going. the Bible is the number one manuscript. Now we know how history works. History works by uh, eyewitness who saw something, eyewitnesses, and they all seemingly agree on the same thing. So the, they write it down. They want to preserve that. And then history is preserved by written down um, um, matter of fact, you can even click on the Dead Sea Scrolls and you can see how the most the most preserved scriptures of all were found not too many years ago that are thousands or years old. The Dead Sea Scrolls are Bible. They're scriptures that were preserved, miraculously preserved. So, so we know how history works and how Bible tells us about history, but how does the Bible tell us about the future? Well, it's called prophecy. Okay, here's how it works. God gave men of old 
both men that were recorded in the Old Testament and the New Testament, visions and words of and images of future events. Now these men wrote these prophecies down. And then some over 500 years later, some over a thousand years later, some just happened in 1948. These prophecies or these visions were fulfilled hundreds, if not a couple of thousand years later in the detail that they were written. This is how the Bible shows us future events or what is called future history. So eschatology is the study of the last. The last events for people and the last events for this earth. So we get most all of that from the Bible. Now I'm going to give you one more ology word. Archaeology. Archaeology. Ology, the study of archae, which is um, uh, it's the scientific study of material remains like tools, pottery, jewelry, stones, carvings, uh, monuments of past human activities and culture. Now get this. Archaeology has actually been the primary proof of the Bible concerning history, both for natural things and for spiritual things. Okay, so we've got theology, the study of divine God. We've got eschatology, which is the study of end-time events through the understanding of this divine God. And we get most of that through the Bible, which is the written word of God that explains both history and future, like prophecy. And then we have archaeology, which is the study of past human life and activities and culture that is the number one validator of the Bible. Okay, so I just wanted to put that out while we're even studying this, okay? So now, to jump into chapter 5. Chapter 4, uh, Revelation, the final separation. Chapter 4 was talking about um, um, keys that we could just, general keys that we could unlock or interpret the Bible generally. Now, chapter 5 are nine keys that will help unlock uh, not just prophecy, but also specific keys to unlock prophecy in the book of Revelation. I'm going to jump all the way down to key number nine. Now you're going to get the rest of them in our next blog where we actually do chapter five. This is just to warm us up. Now, key number nine is the key of divine order. What does that mean? Let's take a look at the book of Revelation, and I want you to know that it was written in divine order and where confusion and fights have come about is when men and women have taken something out of the book of Revelation, they just pulled it right out of the middle, and they pulled it out of order, and they tried to stick it someplace else. It's like one of those, you know, Mr. Potato Head toys, where you have all the right parts of the potato head, but you got the leg sticking out the ear, you got the arm sticking out where the leg goes, you got the eyeball sticking where the other ear goes. You've got all the right parts, but you've got the whole thing out of order. Okay. Now, maybe you'll relate to this. When I first started studying the book of Revelation, I was pretty naive and I didn't know a lot. So I just tried to read the book of Revelation with the simple understanding I had. I tried to determine through people in the book of the Bible I already knew, symbols that I already knew. There weren't very many. And I tried to put them all together. So uh, I started with Revelation um, chapter 1, verse 19. And it's when John is told, write down the things... You're going to write down things that are in the past. You're going to write down things that are happening now. And you're going to write down things that are going to be in the future. Did you just catch that order? You're going to write down things in the past, things now, things in the future. That is the order of the book of Revelation. Don't take it out of order. And you will understand more than you ever thought you could. Okay, so now, here I am. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Oh, let me give you the second part of, of the key number 9. The second part of key number 9 is... There are verses written specifically for Jews, which is most of the Bible. And there are verses written specifically for Gentiles. 
Now, in the Revelation, it, it is the end, the, the separ separating everything out, and God is going to deal with everything in perfect order. So the first seven chapters in the book of Revelation are primarily about the reckoning or the end time of Gentile believers, followers of Christ. You get that? The first seven chapters, primarily about Gentiles. And then from chapter 7 on in the book of Revelation, primarily about Jews and the nation of Israel. You get that? This is a big clue. Okay, so here, let's jump into Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 12. So Revelation chapter 12. Wait a minute now. We're past the first seven chapters. So Revelation chapter 12 is going to be about who? Jews and the nation of Israel. This is how we're going to uh, interpret this. So we're reading in the book of Revelation, and I've got it all listed there be below us. Uh, well, maybe I should just read it real quick. Okay, let me just read it. Um, just in case you don't have it with you. Here we go. Uh, it's going to be our practice and to warm us up uh, for the rest of our book. Verse 1. We want to ask, okay, here's, okay, we want to come in with this with a question. Who is the woman? Um, who's the woman in chapter 12? Who is the male child or the man child? And who's the dragon? Who are these people? We want to know who they are. Okay, so here we go. Who are they? We're going to try to interpret this. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Verse 2. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. Verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars out of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Verse 6. Then the woman fled to the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, and that they should feed her there one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Now, <laughs> With the limited understanding I had at the time. Okay, who do you think the woman is? Who do you think the male child is? I thought the woman was Mary, the mother of Jesus. It made sense to me. That's about all the knowledge I had. And there, that for, therefore, it would make the male, man child, the male child, Jesus himself. Because in the verse, it says, And the male child was caught up to the throne room of God. And that would have been Jesus, you know, resurrecting. Wow. And then I justified it by Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, that John was speaking of something from the past. Except we're in chapter 12. John is speaking of something that hasn't taken place yet. So it couldn't be Mary, the mother of Jesus, and it couldn't be Jesus. Who are we talking about? This is where the Bible interprets itself. And this is where we need each other. Some know more about the Bible than others. This is where we need each other so we can say, Hey, I, I remember a verse. I know a verse uh, that has almost those same word, words. Let's look it up. Okay, so here is the Bible Guy Breakdown, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. This is to warm us up on interpreting the whole book of Revelation. Here we go. The woman is not Mary. The woman is actually a group of people. She represents a group. She represents the nation of Israel. The woman is national Israel. How do we get this? Well, one of the clues is in Genesis 37, 9 through 11. Remember when Joseph, you know, the coat of many colors, had a dream that uh, uh, about the woman that had the stars above her head and the moon. This woman is Jacob's or Israel's wife. And the moon is Israel. Uh, the moon, Jacob's wife, stars. Okay, The interpretation comes way back in the Old Testament. So the woman is not Mother Mary, but a type of Jacob's wife in Joseph's dream 
the woman is national Israel as a whole. Thus she was crowned with the twelve stars around her head, which are who? The twelve tribes of Israel. She is national, a representation of natural Israel. National Israel. Okay, so who's the male child then? Oh, who's the male child? The man child is the 144,000 Jews. Revelation 12, 5, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes or the 12 stars around the woman's head. These are a group of people also who were birthed or came out of the nation of Israel. And she had a hard birth because we need to make a note here. At this time, Israel is not following Jesus. Israel is not a Christian nation. Okay, so this was a hard birth for 144,000 Jews confessing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's a hard birth for the nation of Israel. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the timeline too, because that's going to help us also. The timeline is mid-tribulation, three and a half years into the seven-year tribulation. How do we know that? Because halfway through the tribulation, the Antichrist, or I'm, I'm sorry, the dragon, who is the Antichrist, the dragon with the big red dragon with the big tail. Okay, so the dragon is the Antichrist, who halfway through the tribulation, he steps into the temple that he had built for the Jews and he makes an animal sacrifice and he declares himself as God. Then the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, they stand up and say, no, 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 you're not God. We know who is God. Jesus, the Son of God, is who we serve. He is the true King and Messiah. Now you know if you said anybody else was God in that hour, the Antichrist would have their heads cut off. So he was waiting right there as the woman was giving birth to the male child. He was waiting right there. He's going to kill all 144,000. But what happens? God raptures them right up to his throne. And then the next thing that happens is the woman is swept away and hidden for 1,260 days. What is that? Three and a half years. So right here, mid-tribulation, now, now what does that mean? The woman is, she's national Israel. So right now she's a remnant. She's national Israel. She's a remnant, a very small group. They're still not serving Jesus, but they collect all of their governmental documents and everything that, that proves what tribe you're from and the list of everybody whose tribe's tribe. And they go off to a place prepared by God for the next three and a half years until the tribulation ends and they're hidden until Jesus comes back. Oh, the 144,000, they show up again. Remember, they were to rule the earth with... Um, with a rod of iron? Oh, they come back with Jesus in Revelation chapter 19. As Jesus comes back to rule with a rod of iron, he brings his the bride of Christ with him. He, and he brings his military with him, his warring angels. And he brings who? The 144,000, 12,000 out of each tribe to be the new government of Israel. And when Jesus sets his foot back on the earth, that new government is established. And guess what? Those who were hidden in the rocks, those Jews that were hidden with all their governmental documentation, they have a list of everybody's um, uh, entitlement uh, from tribe to tribe. So this was just a little warm up. I hope you liked it. Um, in the next post, I'm going to do chapter five as a whole. We're going to look at every specific uh, of all the nine keys on how to interpret uh, both prophecy and the book of Revelation. But here we are. We can interpret 
the Word of God, with the Word of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, and with the gifts that God has put into the family of God to lead and guide us and direct us along. I hope you enjoyed it. I pray that your day would be blessed, and I look forward to seeing you getting back into Revelation, the final separation. Thanks.